This video is a 3D protein viewing experience. To view this properly, you're going to need a VR headset or Google Cardboard or something like that. If you don't have that, there's also a version of this video that's not in 3D for you to enjoy. But the best way to view this is in 3D, so if you're ready, let's uh, strap on your VR headset and let's begin. What you're looking at right now is a protein turning slowly in three-dimensional space. This rotation is artificial. I'm doing this so that you can see the whole protein. But this is an actual 3D structure of a real protein. Scientists can crystallize proteins and then shoot the crystal with x-rays. The direction that the x-rays bounce off is used to determine the actual 3D structure. So, although individual proteins are too small to be seen, we can use the x-ray crystallography data to view them. Scientists can view the same protein in different ways, and we use computer programs to make models or renderings, depending on the important information we want to convey about the structure. In this video, I want to introduce you to the basics of molecular visualization so that you can begin to understand what you're even looking at when you see a picture of a protein in a textbook, or if your instructor wants you to look at a protein using one of these modeling programs. And I've figured out how to show this to you in 3D without expensive glasses or having to cross your eyes at a printed magic eye style picture until the protein popped out at you. Seriously, this is how we used to have to do this, and it always gave me a terrible headache. You should have a basic understanding of the levels of protein structure before watching this video. We need to start with something small, so we're going to look at the amino acid alanine first. Notice the color coding. This is called CPK coloring, and it tells us which atoms we're looking at. Nitrogen is always blue, and oxygen is red. Take a good look at the red atoms. The program that I'm using shows a double line to show the double bond to the carbonyl of the amino acid carboxyl group. This structure is not shown at biological pH. Notice there is a white colored hydrogen atom on the other oxygen. Amino acids ionize and form zwitter ions in the body, so that hydrogen atom would be on the amine group at biological pH. But typically we show the proteins without any of the H atoms anyway because they clutter up the image too much. So you need to remember your rules for valence and ionization when viewing this stick rendering of the protein structure since you won't see any of the hydrogen atoms. Here I've arbitrarily colored carbon green, but we can choose any color for carbon. However, it is unwise to color the carbon atoms dark blue or red since you'll lose structural information. Sulfur is another element found in amino acids like methionine here, and its CPK color is yellow. So you probably want to avoid that color for backbone carbon atoms as well. Before we move on, let's look at alanine once more. See how when nitrogen is on the left, the side chain group points backward, and when the carboxylate is on the left, it points forward? This is because of the stereochemistry of that carbon atom. Most amino acids are chiral compounds, and only one of the enantiomers is found in human proteins. This plays a big role in the 3D structure of the protein and determines which molecules the protein will interact with. Remember, individual amino acids link up in long chains to create the secondary structure of a protein. Here, we're looking at a tripeptide made up of cysteine, valine, and lysine. Notice the nitrogen is next to a carbonyl now. We get an amide, or peptide bond, when the amino acids link up. This isn't too bad to look at. But things get a little crazy once we start viewing this 10-amino acid decapeptide. And it's even worse when we look at an entire protein rendered as sticks. We can sort of start to see the overall shape, but the image is really cluttered and confusing. We can simplify this a lot with a rendering called the alpha trace. This makes a line through the peptide bonds of the protein, ignoring side chains. The way that many proteins are rendered for textbooks and journal articles is the ribbon diagram. 
though we're losing the detail of the side chain atoms, we're seeing the overall structure of the protein very easily, along with the alpha helices and beta sheets that make up the secondary structure. Let's look at this beta sheet in a little more detail. Suppose we want to prove to ourselves there are strategically located hydrogen bonds that stabilize this beta sheet and hold the structure together. It's advantageous to zoom in and show the stick rendering overlaid on the ribbon diagram. Now we can add in the hydrogen bonds. I've colored these dashed lines yellow. Notice how they connect blue nitrogen atoms to red oxygen atoms. This is because the hydrogen atom is not shown for clarity. To understand this rendering, we have to know that the nitrogen is actually an NH group and that there's a hydrogen atom making the H bond to the carbonyl oxygen. Now let's take a look at the alpha helix. These twisting amino acid clusters are also stabilized by backbone hydrogen bonds. When we show the stick rendering and add in the yellow hydrogen bonds, we'll notice they line up differently. Each carbonyl group is bonded to an NH of another backbone atom three to four amino acids away. Another very common way to render a protein is by showing the surface. This traces the outside edge of the protein. Notice in some spots on this protein there are little holes where there are no amino acid residues and this makes a gap. Let's look at an enzyme in the surface view. Here we're looking at hexokinase, the first enzyme involved in the process of breaking down sugar in your body. Because this is an enzyme, it catalyzes a chemical reaction in a region of the protein called the active site. And this one does so in a deep cleft on the enzyme. Can you spot the active site? This crystal structure actually has a molecule of glucose bound in the active site. Let's show that as magenta sticks and zoom in. Pretty neat, glucose is sitting there right inside that cleft. It's a little hard to see, so let's change our view of the protein to a ribbon diagram. Another way to represent the glucose molecule is using a sphere representation. Kind of like the surface rendering of the protein, this shows the space that the molecule is taking up within the enzyme. Maybe we want to keep in mind where the surface of the protein is. So let's overlay a see-through mesh onto the ribbon diagram. Now we have a sense of the surface of the enzyme, the secondary structure, and we can see the space that the glucose molecule occupies. Awesome! I hope you thought this was super cool and are inspired to look at some proteins on your own. If you are, I put some links in the video description for you to download the viewing software I use, and then you can peruse more than 120,000 structures of proteins and other macromolecules available in the Protein Data Bank.